Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so I am temporarily leading this meeting. Um, hopefully, um, I behave appropriately. <laughs> so um, anyway, all right. So of course, again, the curriculum um, for us to follow, we have that and how we're gonna proceed on that. So we'll see, it doesn't seem to be having any problem with that. And we have, um, I think, no new faces today. Um, possibly new faces will join. Um, and then we'll allow time for new folks to introduce themselves. And, um, and the next, whoever's next on the new person side can speak for themselves. And um, I don't want people, though, to feel like they have to... Um, that they have to I mean for example let's say I'm explaining something and a new person joins and everybody's distracted by the new person coming and then we interrupt and introduce them I, I think we'll wait until we are between topics and a natural pause to introduce people have them introduce themselves rather okay so Anastasia so Rob um, I'm just wondering what's going on with you because we don't have Rob today. Anastasia says, okay, yeah, I'm going to talk about AWS, um, in London and I have some experience with, um, some accessibility issues that I could talk about interpreting and so forth. And, um, I, I think some interpreting issues could definitely be clarified and some communication could be approved for sure. Um, but you know, sometimes it feels like you have to go through a lot of people to get to the right person to even have those conversations. So people are like, yes, we'll have interpreters or, or yes, we'll have information for you. And then that's not actually the case when you arrive or like you'll have it just for the keynote, they'll have an interpreter for the keynote, but um, that's an hour and a half. That's not the conference, you know? so you're, you're trying to grab the interpreter and figure out how that works. And um, then you're told they're only there for an hour and a half for the keynote and that's it. And so it's, it's hard to figure out who to talk to about it, who's responsible for it and not get the runaround trying to do that. So um, it, it's difficult to make accessibility happen when it's that hard to find the right person. And um, in the main auditorium, you know, of course, there's, they provide interpreters, like I said, for the keynote, but there's no interpreter for other things, even if it's happening there. And um, it, you can't get the interpreters to do anything but the main, main keynotes or speeches or talks or anything. And, I, and then they tell me, no, I can't. Or... Um, another person says, oh yeah, I, I'm having the same problem getting interpreters and um, there's no, you know, there's no interpreter to go with us anywhere to other talks or other meetings or other connections. And, um, and it, it seems like they don't really want our feedback either. So it's just been very, very difficult to um, make communication happen with that group. And um, I've tried on LinkedIn and that seems to be the only way that I can get somebody connected to the process to get hooked up. So, um, and that was AWS. And so, you know, I've, I've tried really hard to get in touch with them. A lot of places I'm not getting an answer. Rob checked and he's trying to um, get into the U.S. side of AWS to get um, hooked up to the right person there, too. But um, the local person in the UK, I'm making no headway whatsoever. And um, it's really hard to get access with them. And uh, maybe Rob seems to be escalating on his side in the US. And um, I don't know if it's gonna help me in the UK, but we'll see. Is that all you wanted to say, Anastasia? Malad's asking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I would like to add something. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, sorry. Yes. I had one more thing I wanted to add before I received the floor. Um, for future conferences or whatever. Um, I think it's important to try to find the person responsible, you know, continue to do that, even though communication has been really hard. Social media sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, you know, with AWS, it's been really hard to find that person um, in the accessibility area who will make that happen. So once we get their attention, then we can bring the problem to them and, um, and we can, I mean, I don't think we need to be afraid to speak up and tell places like AWS that, that they're doing it incorrectly and we can help them. I mean, Catherine, you wanted to add? Uh, yes, so I I just want to emphasize how important it is for everyone to speak up. And I know it can be draining. You had a frustrating experience and then just like, just writing it down and all over it can be, yeah, drain, just draining. It, you don't want to talk about it. But if you are silent and go home and don't say anything, not, nothing will change, right? And I know that Anastasia was a little bit felt like that, but then we had a different blog post, a uh, different LinkedIn post um, um, on um, um, Milab's talk. And then she was like, oh yes. And it's like, this is like, let me, let me talk about like, then she found the energy, right? And it is really important. Yes, her, like the UK person, we tagged her several times, no response whatsoever, which is embarrassing, quite frankly, right? Uh, but it is important to make it public, you know, so everyone can see it. Uh, now that you're connected with uh, a lot more people in the community, like more people will see it. And um, it doesn't mean that change will always happen. The good thing is we have a combination here. We have Anastasia who took the time to write the very detailed description of what happened and how frustrating it was. It, and it, what I always say, tell them how you feel, how it made you feel. This is important, you know, like, cause people don't really, we do shortcuts all the time and they don't really understand what it means not, not having accessibility at a conference. So tell them how it makes you feel. So people are like, okay, this is terrible. We, we need to change that, right? And the good thing that we have here is that Anastasia put it on LinkedIn. Rob has contacts with people at AWS, AWS and he escalated it, right? So like we have several tools and whether that is going to have like a change due to that one post, we don't know. But like, if I don't know, you know, like next time Sandeep is uh, at a AWF conference or another conference, we do it again. And at some time, at some point it will change. Cause uh, if they didn't seem very interested when Anastasia was reaching out, but if you shame them publicly at some point they will, right? Like if, if they don't want to do it out of good heart, let's, public shame them because they should they should be they should be doing this they should not ignore you uh, and again I know it's very draining but you cannot just sit back and not do it because again you have to be you have to push for change right because no one will no one will fight I mean we have allies and whatever but ultimately no one will fight unless you fight as well so uh, just yeah, just I think that was a very good example and and we need to do this more and more. And I think that's one of the things of this working group is like helping each other to to do that and then helping spread the word. So thanks Anastasia for doing it. And I know it's it's not easy. <laughs> I'm alive. Daja, anything else you'd like to add? Anybody else want to add anything to Anastasia's topic? Anastasia says, yeah, actually, well, I forgot my mind went blank. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, I want to say what Catherine said is right. It can be very draining when the access is being blocked or is a struggle. You may feel like, oh, I don't want to deal with it. No one's really going to be caring about this. But I think it's important to invest a little bit at a time 
to raise awareness about these topics and that the word can get out repeatedly. And I feel like if that does happen, then it will be successful. Thank you. Um, so CPF is the next topic on the agenda. Uh, uh, just one thing, just one thing if I can add. Yeah. So Anastasia, uh, uh, very sorry to hear about your experience. Uh, I have actually experienced this inaccessibility quite a few times. And it really, really hurts because you cannot really participate in the conference. And I think the main aim of conference is networking. And I think, you know, you can even watch in YouTube. But without an interpreter, you cannot really network. So maybe one of the things that we can do is we already have a best practice in document. We started with the document, but I think we never got around to giving it a fin finishing touches. Uh, so maybe I think if we, if we circle on this document well advanced, well ahead of the conference, then even they would get a chance to know what they can do. Most of the time, the inaccessibility is not because people don't want to help. It's simply because they don't know what to do. And also, in the last minute, they cannot really, they are not in a position to hire an interpreter at the last minute. Because when you are running a conference, there are a thousand things you have to take care of. And CNCF is able to do it because uh, we reach out to them very well ahead in advance. They know we are meeting, they know we are planning. So they are able to give us all of this accessibility because of the advanced planning. With AWS, probably thought that the captions may be enough. Maybe the interpreters may not be needed. So, so I think maybe, uh, maybe I think in your LinkedIn post, it's the right way to do. We also need to publicize our best practice in document. We have to publicize it. We have to publicize it across all the channels so that more and more people are aware of what we have put together. Because this best practice in document is our collective effort. It is what we have put together. And until we release it out, until we publicize it, uh, we will not be able to see the change that we are expecting. Because then we are not bringing awareness at the right point of time in the right way. Maybe publishing this document is a much better way to raise awareness. Yes, thank you, Sandeep. You're right, I wanna to add to what you just said. I gave advice um, and I said, you know, when you have requests for access, whether it's a uh, sign language interpreters or whatever. We should add um, to our best practices document how to provide best access, because I feel like at AWS, they didn't understand what our needs were. Yeah. I also want to add that um, when people come to our meeting and they want to communicate with us, and we respond to through an interpreter. Excuse the interpreter. So when we have an interpreter that is able to give access in the conference, then we're able to fully participate instead of just doing part of it or just the keynote speaker. Um, so sometimes I'm told, oh, we're only able to provide interpreters for half of the conference or they don't provide full interpretation services. And so when I show up, there's nothing provided. And so I'm not able to communicate with the other participants. So we need to add to the best practices document that when people are asking for access, that they have these types of things ready to then help facilitate that. Thank you for that. Uh, and and if you do, if you still don't get a response from NMLUS, let me know. I'll try to see if 
few of my friends in AWS I help I able to help amplify. Okay, so I know like uh, quite a few community managers. So maybe I'll reach out to them and see if they can help so that the next time this doesn't happen. Thank you, Sandeep. Okay, next. I would just like to add something to the best practices. So the first best practices for, con well, the document that we have for conferences, we- Can I, uh, it's emailed. Um, so when you click on the, can you provide interpreters in the meeting, then we can add a line that says to the best practices document, a link right there to the best practices document. And Milad says, yeah, you can see the link right there in the chat. Yeah, I think that it also needs to be updated because we that's the very first uh, uh, document that we created. Uh, and we've been to uh, several conferences since, since then. And I think uh, we do need to revisit that document. Maybe we should look at it like at least once a year, you know, kind of like, did anything change or what just to make sure that because we're learning you're learning you're seeing things and i think um just writing something and then just letting it there and then sending it to people without really looking at it again may not be the best approach because i think that's kind of like the core at least for conferences that's the core thing so i think we should probably revisit that because uh we also changed a few things as we talked to celia from the uh, linux foundation uh uh events team so um that yeah maybe may, something to tackle soonish it might uh i'm just looking at it too and from doing an of uh, doing events before it might help to have a too long didn't read kind of checklist for events people as they're going and maybe even like gold standard and then at a minimum um, just to get people started or try to with limited re those who have limited resources, you know, what you can do with limited budget and what would be ideal, something like that. Yeah. I like the checklist actually, because one thing that the, that we try to do with the best practices, and I think that's really good is always explaining why, why are interpreters between talks important or network? Cause it's like a lot of times people just don't think about it, but that makes it very long and cumbersome, right? So maybe just having like a checklist, da, 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 these are all things. And then are you wondering why, right? Like here you have the explanation. So it's like, it's more because it is mixed between like an educational thing where it's like really kind of like explaining whole, the whole context, but that makes it really long, really long. And it might, it might feel overwhelming. So having the checklist and underneath really like the explanation, um, because you still need the explanation, right? But it, it, yeah, I think that's a really good idea to make it more usable, user friendly. Yeah. And and you know, um, I don't know who else on this call has done events before, but I know usually there's a really long spreadsheet of just checking the box. You know, what's for lunch? What? Uh, who does the speakers? Are the agreement signed? So, adding checks that they should put in there, are helpful. Maybe a, a a spreadsheet that they can just copy, and customize. Yeah. I love, like that idea, actually. Maybe so, so one that works like is in the format that events people are used to work in. And then uh, that's a really good idea. And then we put it at the very beginning and say, download your uh, uh, spread check checklist, accessibility checklist. And then uh, the document is actually the why and so on. I love that. Wow, actionable ideas. <laughs> cool. Anastasia says, great. Malad saying, okay. Anastasia, do you want to add anything? And Anastasia is saying, um, KubeCon, CFP. Do you want to add anything about that? Anybody have any information? And I would like to take that on. If I think there's two weeks left. Malad saying we need some signatures. Um, we need some ideas for some talks. Two weeks left. Anything? <laughs> Sandeep saying, let's go. Less than, yes, two, we less than two weeks. 
Yes, less than two weeks through. <laughs> uh yeah so we have one talk that has already been submitted so that's really exciting so Anastasia and Travis are going uh like submitted an introduction to cloud native talk uh then Anastasia is also kind of uh also looking at an observability talk hopefully we also ha are working on something for Sandeep on security and something for Rob as well uh, so if you have ideas, right, then please let us know only two weeks. Um, so one thing that I was thinking, we submitted two talks last uh, in Paris that didn't get accepted. And I didn't get accepted because they don't have a lot of space for accessibility, which is a real, I don't know, <laughs> for accessibility talks. They're like, oh, one is enough. I don't think so. But um, so I think we should uh, re- uh, submit the deaf voices in cloud native. I think I will just tweak it a little bit so it's a little bit different. But like I think I think it was not some it was not accepted because we had another accessibility one. So uh, I don't think it was that the talk itself wasn't good. Um, and then uh, Rob submitted one with me, and he always talks about the curb cut effect, and I think that could actually be a really good talk so Wait, i'll sorry, ping uh, him, which... can you can you repeat that the cripcon just to clarify what you curb said cut, curb cut effect which basically i don't remember what it is thank you for clarifying yeah, so i think it is that in the uh, i think it comes from the um what's it called in the sideways that you put like uh, you lower it for uh, wheelchairs so it was it was for people with disabilities, but then like people with baby carts, with bikes. With... So saying like, if you do accessibility, implement accessibility, a lot more people benefit than actually the people it was intended for. So apparently that was intended just for people with wheelchair, but like so many more people benefit. If, I think that's what, because Rob mentions all the time. And that's with accessibility, right? We talk about uh, captions, are good for people who are non-native speakers and so on. So there's like, there's a lot of that. So I think it's actually a really cool, cool uh, talk to talk about all these ways where you think it is for a very narrow group, but it actually benefits so many more people. So I think that could be a really good talk. And then another one that I was thinking is I would love to see more groups like the deaf and hard of hearing for different uh different minorities and just like saying like, hey, uh, like a talk that where we talk about that, this could be like a blueprint, you know, like uh, like a call to action out there is like, is there anyone, would you like to do the same, you know, like work on best practices uh, to help your community, uh, either whether you're blind or neurodiverse or whatever, right? Like what, so I think that could be a, a good way of talking about what we're doing but also uh, kind of encouraging other people and just putting the seed out there that, uh, you know, there could be more. Um, so I think that could be like a good, like an interesting talk as well. Um, and that's all I had. I'd like to add about the accessibility topic. I think it's really interesting. I saw a statistic from the KubeCon in Paris, and they said that caption users are... The top languages in caption are um, French, English, Spanish, and the interpreter missed another one. Um, and English also used in the UK. So not just around um, English caption, but worldwide caption is being used by many people, not just signing people. Okay, so one and a half weeks to go. So whoever is interested. And I think we can move to the next one. Next topic, I mean. Uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine, you say something about in the CFP. You say something like you and Rob submitted something. You and Rob submitted. What was that? The capital uh, transfer. The transfer. Yeah, so, like, 
Uh, so, so the transcript showed me as showing uh, showing that you and Rob submitted something. Yeah, last uh, for Paris, we submitted one talk, which I actually think should be two, because uh, it started out with something about the um, about the um, the working group, but all, Rob added like a section about like the curbside uh, curb. What is it? The curb cut effect. I have to remember. Uh, and okay. um, yeah, yeah. so I thought that is actually that could actually be two different talks. So I think that is that could be its own. And instead of doing just just the working group, which might be a little bit boring, you know, because we've done one already, and it's like uh, um, it could be something that's more like a call to action to the community. Um, so I just read the two abstract this morning before our talk, uh, our meeting. So just to see, like, because we need, like, as as, as we said, like time is ticking so what could we um uh, submit and i think that's like a second talk for sure and then again like let's tag team right like if rob is up for that like rob can co-present because then we get like more people in, in the speaking so we can always each talk and have two people so let's uh let's try to get as many people as possible on the stage but uh let me ask him if he's up for that and if not maybe someone else wants to do that topic but but I'm sure he is. And then that could be uh, another one where someone can jump on uh, that talk. Uh, okay, so if a talk if a talk has been rejected, we can always resubmit the same talk. Yeah, right? yeah. you can always do it because like the way the way uh, I don't know if everyone knows how talks are selected, but Basically, uh, there is a call for um, like people. The community actually um, um, applies to be part of the program committee. So it's not the CNCF. It's not the Linux Foundation who actually selects the talks. Like each time there, there is a conference, you can apply. Anyone can apply to be part of the program committee. You have to be a cloud native expert, of course. You cannot just, you know. <laughs> so so you have to be like you have to be you know, like prove that you have the expertise and then you review, uh, like each person gets to review, I think between 50 or a hundred uh, abstracts. So it's a lot, right? And they kind of start like giving them like little um, grades or I don't know exactly how it is. And then like several people review it. And then ultimately the, the co-chairs, uh, like the people who are on stage uh, <laughs> during the keynote, uh, they will re see like what the recommendation is and they will uh like see if it's fair if they're like if it's diverse on companies on projects on on and like kind of make sure that it fit like it's it's it fits all the um criteria um so, so basically whoever uh reviewed that talk is not going to be the same people so it's like it changes right so uh, it's different people have different opinions and sometimes maybe some People thought it was a terrible talk. Other people think it's a great talk. So you never know because it's not like, yeah, it's right. It's a day. but I think like it's always an opportunity to revisit it, look at it again, and see like maybe there's something that we could improve. So I would definitely kind of look at it again and then just try to tweak it, improve it a little bit. But there's no reason to not repurpose it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so moving on. Yeah, Anastasia, you go ahead. So, okay, we'll, we'll move on. All right. Um, so the next meeting, um, Cloud Native, no, I guess it, yeah, I guess it's Cloud Native. So that's 5th of June. So um, we can talk about some signs and um, applying for um, talks, to do talks and things like that. And about the tools we might need or whatever we need to get involved at Cloud Native. So um, did you did you wanna add something? Like the issue, um, the comments, the signing comments? Thank you. 
Milan saying I would like to add in terms of speaking. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity because it's not only, you know, getting out there in front of people, it's an opportunity to improve your own career and your job and um, how you're perceived as a technical expert or um, really it's kind of a funny thing. My employer um, noticed at my speech and my, my uh, talks at KubeCon and um, it's going to have an effect on my career in terms of promotion and uh, possible salary uh, implications. So, it, I mean, I could be wrong, but when you are visible in a world where companies lay people off all the time, take the opportunity to have a talk at one of these conferences. It might reduce your chances of being laid off. They might see you as a more valuable asset. And I mean, I could be wrong. It's just my opinion, but I was noticed in a way I had not been before after I came back from KubeCon Paris. So, um, you know, it gives you an opportunity to improve your um, ability to do public speaking, your technical expertise, um, polish up your shine, uh, you know, so that's, that's something you could apply to your next assignment or your current job. So I would encourage you um, anytime you have an opportunity to do that, whether it's a basic or very advanced technical talk, um, I'd be happy to help if it's something I know about. And um, if it's content that I can help you with, I'd be help, happy to help you and uh, make suggestions to that. So I suggest everyone give it a shot. All right. So um, Anastasia or Catherine, did you have something? No, I wanted just to say, like, absolutely, it helps uh, your career, right? Like, uh, and, and, and also. So I know everyone is a little, it was a little bit shy at the beginning. It's like, oh no, it's like asking my boss to go to that conference or whatever. Once they see you on stage, you you saying, I work for company X, you're there. People are like, wow. And first of all, like you're, you're basically giving them free PR, right? Uh, then uh, you're making them look good too. Cause like everyone wants, we all want companies who are accessible and you're basically prove prove that your company is accessible. So they look good again, not just because they have an expert, but also because they provide accessibility, they send you there. And so as they see you, you know, be on stage, on streams and whatever, like being out there versus like hidden in your little office where no one can see you, right? They're gonna be like, yeah, we're gonna support you. You know, you wanna go there, you, cause it's, not only good for you it's good for them so it's like it's yeah so it's like 100 percent. and i'm so glad that uh, milan actually experienced it like he just did it and was like wow you know like it's not just this company like every company will do that so it is important for you for your career and it will help you and um also for your uh for the uh, meetups that uh milan and uh, anastasia host that's a great uh, way to practice too, you know, like going then in a bigger stage is always a little bit more, uh, <laughs> you know, makes it a little bit more nervous, but use that as a, uh, as a uh, practice, right? Like in a smaller round with, with your friends, you know, like you see people, uh, like people in this group will be there. It's a great opportunity to improve your speaking, presenting skills because, um, no one is great like at the very beginning like it is something that requires practice right so um 100 uh agree with milad and and yeah it's a great opportunity and please take advantage yeah Anastasia is agreeing yes mm -hmm. and milad says um yes um so the next thing i see is that um we can have a discussion or maybe some brainstorming or some ideas um that what has worked in terms of our meetings and our experience, um, pros and cons on um, for example, um, like on Zoom, when we're I talk with Anastasia on Zoom and I feel comfortable that way. Um, but for Zoom, for example, when we get a lot of people joining in a Zoom meeting, um, and we, sometimes we can get people moved over to YouTube for some things. And, you know, this is just my opinion, but um, people often don't come back 
after just seeing a YouTube video and we want them to come back. So it's a little complicated on getting people in different uh, mediums or different social, social media sites. So I don't know if Anastasia or, you know, I mean, like, should we stay on Zoom, but also we can ask um, to get key traffic on YouTube so we can like post it from the Zoom platform on YouTube so that we can have, can we do it live at the same time on YouTube and Zoom, for example, for these meetings, um, if people wanna watch, um, are we ready to go live on YouTube? And people could have their camera off, except if they're speaking um, or hosting, and um, we could have that um, recorded or we could uh, stream it at the same time on YouTube. And then, um, we could also, of course, stay on Zoom, but I feel like we've lost some people and we may not have as many people coming because we don't have as many places for them to join. Anastasia, what are your thoughts? Well, one thing, like on LinkedIn, um, like in that setting, I'm not really 100% sure. Um, I would need more you know, investigation on that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I have noticed multi uh, streaming ways to access certain meetings, LinkedIn, YouTube, Zoom. Yeah, I had forgotten about LinkedIn. They do that too. Any other ideas? Anything else you think we should be using going forward? Well, um, we need more investigation on some of that, on how people would prefer to access it. Um, you know, Zoom, obviously we can stream that and send it out on YouTube or something like that. But yeah, I mean, Zoom, anybody have an experience on how to make more than just a couple oh. of different um, ways of I'm sorry, everybody was moving with everybody putting their hands up. I, mi I missed the last thing you said. <laughs> yeah, when everybody moves. Yeah, it's a, it's a great platform. <laughs> Anybody have, have other thoughts? Oh, one thing, just one question. Uh, what's the contact been discussed here? Uh, I'm not getting what Milad is trying to say. Um, Anastasia said, like in cloud native meetings, um, a lot of times they make it accessible via Zoom and then people can watch it on YouTube as well. They can watch it later on YouTube or we can stream both at the same time and people can participate that way. And um, we're just trying to solve the problem of how to give people different entry points to the meetings. Um, okay. Jay, did you have something too? Thank you. Yeah, Zoom, I think, has a webinar feature. Yeah, maybe um, Catherine and Travis wanted to add something. Yeah, I mean, which I've tried already with Zoom webinar. And I think you have to use, I'm not sure, actually. Um, I, I learned that um, some people will publicize that on LinkedIn or, you know, that they're going to have a webinar and it's not on the free plan for Zoom. So that may be a challenge. Yeah, if I may just um, say something. So, um, yeah, so webinar, yeah, first of all, webinar is like when one person presents, it's not, not a conversation, right? One person is on on is presenting and everyone else is invisible. You cannot see each other and you can only communicate via the chat. So that's not um, ideal, right? Because this is like a conversation. We want to see each other. Um, we do publish every single of these meetings on YouTube, right? Like, so basically this is the regular uh, CNCF format. All meetings are on Zoom and then they're published so people can watch them on demand. Uh, the streaming, we do the streaming on LinkedIn for the meetup, which is a special kind of, um, 
arrangement that we got with the CNCF because they want to help us get more uh, visibility, right? Because it's like no meetup uh, of the CNCF is ever streamed on the CNCF uh, LinkedIn. Uh, it's uh, every, because there are too many, <laughs> there are meetups all over the world, right? This is the only one who gets to do that on LinkedIn. And just because it's also, uh, because they think it's really important for people to see uh, people okay. signing and, and make it really clear that people are uh, deaf people are also part of this community, right? Um, so uh, I don't know if streaming is is the issue. We do have a drop off, uh, and I think that's. I mean, like sometimes you have like what at the very beginning everyone is very excited and and there is a lot of momentum, and I feel like we we lost a little bit of the momentum. That's true, but like it's it's a come and go. People are busy. It's summer, so I think it's not the issue that can people people cannot join like most of the people who are part of our team they are on slack uh they 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 join we interact but it's more it's probably now it's not new and shiny anymore before it was like everyone was so excited and no one wanted to miss any meeting so i feel it's just maybe more become more routine so i think I don't think the streaming is the uh, thing is like the, the question is like, how do we keep people engaged and and excited so that they come back and they want to meet us and like all, you know, discuss our topics and, and move things forward. So I think that is actually because it's possible to I mean, it's easy to join you just have to put it on your calendar and and uh, click on the Zoom link, right? I don't think that there is a lot of friction there. And I think like the streaming also, the streaming is like going everywhere. And it's like, it's very, the people we're trying to reach is a very narrow group, right? So I don't know how effective the streaming would be. So I would really kind of focus on the, how do we, you know, get people excited and more engaged? Cause I do, I am a little, um, I'm not gonna say disappointed, but it's like, I saw people dropping off and uh, I mean, but, I know it is the normal flow when something just gets normal, right? It's just not exciting anymore. Uh, so one question. So when there's a streaming going on, uh, you cannot interact, you cannot interact with others in the streaming platform, or you can. <laughs> you cannot. So you're not able to just no, you can only ask uh, questions, but there's not you're not allowed to interact in depth with audience members or the person presenting. Okay, so that means that makes it very less engaging, right? Because like it's in a Zoom call, like right now we are all in a Zoom call. It is so interactive. So basically, Zoom is much more interactive. No, you can interact with with your audience in a much better way in Zoom. Question to Milat, because you uh, raised it. Do you, do you agree or not? Like, because it's like, I know that came, the streaming came from you. Because you're big on streaming, I know, but it's like the concerns that I had. But do you, do you agree? Do you see that? Or do you still think that streaming would solve the problem? I don't think the problem is Zoom necessarily. I think we just need to have more engaging topics and content on how, you know, a, a, diver, a diverse type, diverse section of topics. And I think that when we provide a variety of different things, that kind of gives people more interest in coming. Anastasia, do you want to add anything? Anastasia says, well, I'm kind of thinking about um, the different topics, sorry, um, and the things that we've presented in the past. The problem is, is that there's no real way to uh, put the content out there. I feel like the problem is that people just leave Zoom and they don't really attend the live session. They'll just watch it on YouTube. And instead, we want to have more of an interactive component but it's hard to do that when people don't join Zoom or don't come back after attending a session or two or how we can get people to stay for the entirety of the talk and 
or the interaction or whatever's happening. Uh, I think that in, engagement part is what is missing. And so I'm not quite sure how we can improve engagement. Um, like what Malad said about the content, we are trying to make the, the topics diverse, but there's a challenge also because there's not a lot of deaf signing uh, individuals that work within the cloud native environment that want to present. So there is a challenge there to find speakers that are willing, first of all, that have a variety of topics that they can talk on within the cloud native topic. So that's why, you know, we want to engage more people to be involved and talk on a variety of different topics if they're feeling comfortable. And if they're not feeling comfortable, then we can ask, they can ask us to help support them in developing their content and help them eventually present. Malad, did you want to say something? Malad says, yeah, I want to kind of go back to the point here that Catherine mentioned. And Anastasia also mentioned this as well. Zoom is um, I'm not quite sure if Zoom allows multi-streaming capabilities. So that's something we don't really have an answer about yet. Um, I think that for now, we kind of keep this format. And if we look into Zoom and the multi-streaming capabilities, we can come back to this discussion and talk about options. Maybe we'll have different opinions at that time. For now, I think we should just keep the status quo. Thoughts? Oh. Uh, you know, Travis, you want to say something? You both have been very silent. Uh, Maybe he didn't catch his name. Maybe somebody That's... needs to call out Gino or Travis. And I don't know how. Ah. Uh, Travis saying, yeah. After I joined, um, I forget what we call this, uh, this particular meeting, but I joined and um, after the event finished, I took the survey and I wondered if you guys got a survey after the event. It was right after the event ended, I got this survey and I'm not quite sure if you guys got it. Um, if it was, it was, it was actually really unclear to me about who was doing the survey, if it was from CNCF or not. Does anybody else have any information on that? Which survey? I don't know. Yeah, it was a survey. Let me look. It was right after the uh, KubeCon um, in ASL part two. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Did you not get a survey? No one else got a survey? And everyone else is saying, no, 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 not really. Milad's saying, yeah, I didn't get a survey. Uh, you mean KubeCon in ASL or you mean Cloud Native in ASL? I think it was Cloud, well, it was KubeCon, it was Kubernetes in ASL. Oh, it's not, a, it's, the meetup, that's the meetup. So it's called Deaf and Cloud Native. And oh, the yeah, series right. is, yeah, yeah. So uh, did you get? Um, Milad saying maybe it's just an automatic email that's been sent out after mm -hmm. the event that it's just triggered and then you get it. I'm not quite sure how many people got that survey. Anastasia, do you know? And Anastasia says, no, we can look into uh, it. Yes, yes. I think, uh, once, I think uh, that may be an automated email coming from the meetup. Like that. To all the people who have registered and signed up for the meetup, once the meetup finishes, they get an email. Like, how did you find it? I mean, it's a generic email. Milad says, oh, thank you. I see Zeno Chan wants to add something. Go ahead. And Zeno Chin says, yeah, I have an opinion or a thought. It's 
sometimes people may have uh, trouble joining Zoom. They're not quite sure how the platform works. They may be lost, not quite sure how to navigate it. And Malad saying, you mean, could you clarify? And, and Zeno Chin saying, let me start again. Um, Anastasia is changing, uh, uh, clarifying. So it's pretty challenging to have engaging present presentations when you have multiple time zones happening. You can't necessarily include everyone because people, you know, European time zone, American time zone, different things like that. And Malad's saying, right. If we have a speaker in Europe, it's easier because then we can have the talk earlier and that can be accessible to other people in the rest of the, in other countries. But you're right. Zino Chen, I will try to look for some topics and speakers that maybe would be in your time zone. So maybe within the European time zone or the East American time zone, because I think that that would be something that you would be able to catch. Um, maybe 10, maybe nine o'clock at night, and then you're able to catch it because it's not too late in the middle of the night. Zino Chen says, yes, thank you. Thank you, Malad. Um, Catherine? Um, yeah, so uh, uh, two things. Uh, one, I wanted to say most of our people in our group are new to cloud native. Um, so as you learn about that, because you're probably going to say like, oh, I cannot do a talk about cloud native, right? Because it's like, I'm not an expert yet. But there are a bunch of people who are new to you. And as you learn about it, a great way of learning is by teaching, right? So you could do like a very basic talk about things that you just learned, you know, like maybe you just learned something last month and then it's like, oh, I'm just gonna share with the team what I learned last month. And it can be very small. It doesn't have to be an hour, you know? So just see that to you, that it's not gonna work for KubeCon, right? KubeCon is not gonna, <laughs> but for the meetup, you know, just like a, you know, like a, 15, 20 minutes, maybe we can like have two people. You, I don't know. Just like, just think about summarizing what you learned, teaching it to people. And I'm pretty sure there are going to be more interested people as than if you do a talk that is highly technical and just like goes over the head of everyone else. So uh, like use that as a platform for you to learn as well, you know, like to learn and teach. Um, so I think, um, yeah, don't think that you have to be an expert. Um, so that was the one thing that I wanted to say. And I know we have only three minutes. I do want to come back to the, uh, and we don't have to discuss it here, but let's think about how we can make, how we can maybe bring more. I, I, I'm, I'm just glad that Milad brought it up and other people kind of also think that people are kind of getting a little um, disengaged or some. Uh, so let's think about like how uh, we can improve that and get people excited again. So I don't know what the solution is, but um, so those were the two things I wanted to make sure to say. Well, that's it. Great. Thank you. Okay. So we got two minutes left. Uh, I don't want big topics to be brought up. That'll make us go past the hour. So um, we can finish our conversations in chat. If anything else comes up, that's big. Anastasia, anything you'd like to add? Anything brief? We got two minutes left. Jay is raising his hand. Jay, yes, hi. Jay says, yeah, little update on the glossary really quick. Anastasia says, yes. Um, there hasn't really been a lot of activity. We've been very busy the last month for various reasons, that's fine. But Andrew, has done the video, it's a short video, and we've been talking about how to, how to post it and how to post, excuse me, interpreter, how to post a poll for the best time for people to meet online in real time on video to talk about different signs, to throw out ideas, or we can have the conversation in Slack about the glossary. So just wanted to let you all know the status. That's about as much as we've done in the last month. Yay, Milad says, thank you. Wonderful, exciting. <laughs> and and uh, Jay says, 
so in June, I feel like we'll have a lot more progress in the glossary. So it's been a little bit busy. Milan says, all right, Zeno Chen, listen, we got one minute. Make it quick if you can. If you can finish it in the chat, that'd be great. He says, okay. All right, well, thank you all for meeting. It's great to see you all. I hope to see you all again next month. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Thanks to the interpreters as well. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>